when they're um, using the monitor? We we left that decision really up to um, the specialist, the hub site. Um, so I can tell you, like I can use the equipment, but I, I don't. I'm not a medical person, so I don't know exactly where to place things. Now, what I what we found is if um, a physician is willing to work with a guy like me, um, we can make that happen. Uh, but some physicians don't want that. They, they want to see uh, an LPN, an RN, uh, present a patient uh, just to save their time. So they don't have to explain, could you move that to the right? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I don't know what I'm looking for, but I can use the equipment and present the patient. Um, but ty typically, you know, the physicians or, or specialists are wanting uh, to have somebody trained. I just didn't know if it would be um, possible for a home care agent to, you know, assist a patient. It's, it's definitely the trend possible. Going to be it's possible. Which it also kind of goes after some of the, you know, recruiting uh, workforce. So they're going to be trained in everything else. <coughs> right. Go ahead. Um, I follow up to that question and an additional question. In regard to the question about um, spoke staffing, I think that was that question, um, are there regulations, either current or in the pipeline, that might bear on that question? Um, and, and so I was just trying to help out my colleagues in front of me. My, my actual question was, does, do either any of the hubs or spokes you guys are representing um, operate as F2 and Cs? Yes. All right, so this is one of the giant uncertainties in our universe, and we keep getting really kind of mixed information on this. Are FQACs in New York City able to provide real for you to pay for telemedicine service? No. <laughs> but it doesn't prevent them from, from providing the service. So um, um, the Finger Lakes Health Center, um, they've done a ton of um, telemedicine uh, and I'm type clinical application with video conferencing. They've done a lot of that. Uh, they're an FQHC. Uh, our FQHC in our area, the uh, North Country Family Health Center, they've done some. Um, and, uh, you know, some they can get reimbursed for. Um, others, they can't. But they want to provide the service for their patients. And that's, they're eating some of the cost uh, in some cases. And they find other ways through FQHCs. Uh, there's a, there's a, some kind of payment model that they use, right? You guys know about that? Who's, who's from an FQHC in here? <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask questions. <laughs> so we, I, can, uh, I can put you in contact with those, um, the executive directors of those organizations. Um, that, that might be a way to answer that question. Thank you. Can you tell me, is there a, a percentage that you can cite of how many telehealth interactions result in the person actually having to then go to a physical location for follow-up? I can't, I can't give you that data. I don't know. Well, how about from those of you who use it through your experience on, a, on an ongoing basis? Is there is there usually a, uh, we better go check this out somewhere. Oh yeah, we use it to inform um, decision making in terms of when uh, an individual would need an intervention, like a nurse, to go to the home, assess what's going on or that condition. So it's very helpful in allowing us to go when the patient really needs us, um, and then we work really closely with the physician, um, either to, if necessary, get the patient scheduled for a physician appointment, or um, try to work with the physician on what interventions we can do in the home to address the Sharon, did you want to add Well, I, I, we have done studies, and I haven't done them recently, but uh, decreasing the amount of hospitalization rates and looking at your 30-day readmits and your 60-day readmits um, for um, those particular diagnoses. And there's been a significant, in the beginning, when, and when we were you know, proving our grant status, there was a significant decrease in the amount of emergency room care, unnecessary, 
avoidable. What we're looking to do is have avoidable um, emergency visits. Um, so the data was there, very much so. The other thing too is, you, as far as nursing personnel, you're you're getting that daily oversight of the patient, so that as Elizabeth just said, you could have early interventions to prevent exacerbations um, and get the physician involvement more on a daily basis. Um, also too, now with the whole movement, if there is an acute episode of a hospitalization, especially with the Hudson Headwater Group um, and other physicians here in the area, they're going to see their, their physician within that first seven days. Um, so you've got big medical reconciliations, um, all those things positive that are happening that are preventing that amount of um, need for that emergency room visit. Um, and that daily oversight with the case management is huge. I, I just can't stress that enough. If I could add something to the questions about the support staff, uh, the indication we use our service for is, is rather elaborate and a complex decision. However, uh, an LPN can perform the necessary tasks, as far as I know, well within regulation. Uh, it basically consists of obtaining a stroke scale, which is, is a, a somewhat difficult task. Um, but uh, you know it, it's allowable under regulation, so well, I'm not sure if that's helpful. Yeah, we look at, at specifically look at the scope of practice. Um, even though you know, not to put anything against a licensed practical nurse, but some of the things that the assessment piece is something that you have to be very careful of, especially when you're doing community health or if you don't have the patient, or even if you have the patient in front of you, that assessment piece cannot be. You know, part of the licensed practical nurse. It's, I think it's important to see that there is a little bit of a distinction between remote patient monitoring, which they're talking exactly. about, and the video conferencing uh, mm -hmm. peripheral use. Right. So, all of our uh, facilities that use remote patient monitoring uh, for their care management use an RN, right. um, at least. Um, but presenting a patient through video conferencing, even using the peripherals, could be a lot uh, lower than those. Oh, go right ahead. Um, I know this is a bit about our telepsychiatry stuff. Any thoughts of, is it interactive with like virtual reality therapy techniques or is no one really doing that yet? I suppose if I knew what that was, I could <laughs> answer the question. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, so Basically, anything that you can do um, without touching a patient can be done through video cameras. Uh, so for example, our, in, in the movement disorders area, um, there's a lot that a patient is asked to do around their Parkinson's disease to present to um, a physician, uh, a neurologist. Um, so there's like a space requirement for that. They actually have to have room to walk and the neurologist has to be able to see them walk across the room. Uh, but it can be done. Um, so you can't do that in the closet, but. I was just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but, but anything that you can do, um, so I, I don't know what virtual, uh, what is it? Virtual reality therapy, therapy is, is relatively new, but it's used with anxiety disorders and phobias and also PTSD. It's being used out of the University of San Diego to work with veterans on, um, but they, basically it's like you're almost in a video game or there's something in front of you, say you had a phobia of a spider, and then there'll be a small spider, but the therapist works with you and talks through you, you know, and helps reduce it, you know, with you to reduce the anxiety. Um, it's going to be quite effective. Probably possible. Do we have other questions? Okay, I'm wondering, do you have to, are you finding it um, advantageous to work with specialists to get them more comfortable with the technology? Is there some level of readiness training, um, demos, like how do we, you know, how would we go about engaging specialists? Yeah, you have to find, so there's basically three key players in a program. Um, one is kind of a technical, we call the technical champion. That's your 
IT folks, the people who um, kind of understand technology and can make that happen. Then there's an administrative champion uh, that's kind of in charge of overall operations, billing, administration, that kind of thing. And then your clinical champion. Um, we find that the specialists often become clinical champions. They have an interest. We find those people who have an interest in kind of working on it, examining it. The other kind of key person that, that could be are your chief medical officers. <coughs> so those are the guys that um, kind of see that potential and can, um, can really engage with specialists. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the, they, need, uh, they need a fair amount of um, demonstration and interaction uh, to, get, to really grasp what, what they can do and what they can't do. Concerns about security, privacy, those kinds of things? We, so uh, all the video conferencing we've done, um, we use uh, Cisco Jabber accounts. It's a terrible name, um, but <laughs> Cisco Jabber is it's HIPAA compliant and secure. Um, uh, even the peripheral use, um, that's, uh, that's a secure system as well. So we, you know, that's a part of reassuring the patients as well. Um, they're going to have to see that documented um, as a part of their patient, new patient uh, packet, so to speak. But specialists and patients want to know that. Go ahead. So for video conferencing, your Spoke and Hub both have to be licensed sites, correct? Um, so have to be for what purpose, I guess? Like, like they have to be licensed operating sites to be able to, like you can't just have a patient at their home with video conferencing, they need to be at a physical licensed location like a provider's office or a designated center like everyone was talking about, well, correct? So the reason I clarify the question is because um, the, it kind of depends on uh, why you ask. So if you ask, can they be reimbursed? No. So can a patient be in their home and see a specialist and have that reimbursed? No, they can't. But could a, could a specialist meet that patient in his home? Yes, it could. So it, it could happen. Um, the capability is there. Um, other states around the country actually do that. Um, but in New York State, it, it, it can't be. Um, I don't know how a physician would document that. Um, and, I don't, and I know they can't get paid. And then as far as if a patient is receiving telehealth services, is that an allowable visit for Medicaid transportation for that patient to get to the site to receive those services? Can you ask that one more time? <laughs> <laughs> so for patients who have transportation difficulties from Medicaid, they can get Medicaid transportation to go see their doctor. Does the telemedicine piece count towards that Medicaid transportation or is that no longer an option if they're receiving it via telemedicine as opposed to an actual live I don't know the answer to that. I see Elizabeth kind of thinking, that's a fascinating question. <laughs> I would think, uh, I'm completely ill-informed, but I would say yes. I think it would be up at how it's presented, first of all. If it's a billable prior, visit. It's prior approved. And with the changing of the um, Medicaid being managed now, that's a great question. Yeah. You're going and, to and an health center, you're going to a... Right. And some of the rural areas have set up sites in senior centers, um, schools, mm -hmm. so, you know, there's there's a lot of different opportunities. But what I was going to say was there's the inherent issue of reimbursement versus actual service provision, and there is a lot of ambiguity, correct me if I'm wrong, in yeah. terms of uh, the legal ramifications of, the, of uh, telehealth provision in general where you're able to provide the service under, with at least three caveats, that you're licensed in New York State on both sides, that uh, the service, um, any provider that you're consulting with is also licensed in New York State with a certain state supervision. There are vital signs, so there's that uh, monitoring taking place in terms of telemetry. Yep. So, so there are three caveats that actually have to be sort of abided by, but that's, and, and there is that separation of uh, reimbursement versus service provision. So for my purposes in terms of prevention and education, um, our funding comes from hopefully this report, we'll see how that pan 
about because we do have uh, two applications uh, in play now, uh, where we are having a mobile unit with telemetry and, as a component and uh, telehealth, um, where we're using it as a screening tool and for service provision um, in terms of screening and prevention. So for us to provide it, we're not as much worried about direct reimbursement for this service that's being provided because for us, it's uh, more important to have that prevention and education component. Are patients able to use it in their homes? For our purposes, yes. But for medical provision and for the hospital that's collaborating with us, it's a different story, so we're trying to work out sort of the notions there. I don't know if that answers the question, but it sort of separates out the two parts of it. Do we have any other questions? Does anyone on the panel have anything else they'd like to close with? Want to add? Okay, we are going to send out a survey monkey to everyone, asking you what you thought, also what you might. Also